so much, Mayor Haddad. So I'd like to invite our first fantastic plenary panel, uh, moderated by our good friend Andrew Tuck from Monocle Magazine to join us on the stage. While they're getting set up, I would like to uh, specify that this panel will be in English. Um, so if you need translation, uh, head headsets are available and we will be offered to you. I would also like to encourage all of you to take part. This is the human city. We want you all to participate. So there will be time in this and every pl plenary panel for questions. Feel free to provoke, challenge. Um, our, our goal is to really have uh, the richest conversation on this topic possible. With that, I will hand it over to Andrew to lead us away for this opening plenary panel. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, uh, we're here today to answer a very simple question. What is the human city? Uh, I think that all of us know the numbers, and I'm sure that some of them will come up in the conversation now. The movement of people from rural to city is happening all around the world, in the developed world and also in the developing world. And it throws up challenges every day. It's extraordinary this weekend just to watch what was happening in Istanbul. There, the fight over a piece of green space, the feeling that a city was out at kilter with what the people wanted to happen in their urban environment saw 300,000 people take to the streets. How do we listen to those people? How do all cities around the world engage with what their people want? More fundamentally, how do we give people the real basics, whether that's healthcare, education, mobility? Many of these questions get lost often as we talk about the grander scheme. And I think what's interesting today is we have an amazing panel, and we're going to look across a whole range of topics. But I hope that at the end of it, we'll have some real concrete ideas about the things that can be done, the challenges that we all face, and hopefully, also understand why we also probably do need to protect that bit of green space at the end of the day as well. Uh, just to let you know how the panel is going to run, all of the, the panelists will make a short introduction about their perspective on the human city, and then we'll have a short discussion here, and I hope there'll be time to take some questions from everybody in the audience, because I know that there is a huge amount of uh, talent and expertise sitting out there who will certainly have an opinion about what's going on on the stage. Uh, we have to finish on the dot at 11.15 because I've told, been told under no circumstances Stan Bettine and Brazilian and their coffee. So we will definitely finish on time. So let me introduce you to all of the, all the people on our panel. Uh, Wim Elfrink is Cisco's first chief globalization officer. Uh, in his time at Cisco, Wim has established a reputation as an entrepreneur known for incubating businesses that flourish under his leadership. In 2007, he moved to India with his family to establish Cisco's Globalization Center East in Bangalore. Over four years, he turned it into a hub of innovation that now has more than 7,000 employees. In 2011, following the success of the center, the Emerging Solutions Group was formed in Bangalore with Vim as the leader. The group is focused on the creation of new projects and industries. These have included Cisco's smart and connected communities, and virtual healthcare programs. Vim is now based in the US and, of course, still working for Cisco. Renato Garcia is the president and CEO of GE Latin America and is based here in Sao Paulo, where he oversees all of the company's operations throughout Latin America. Over the past 25 years, Renato has been in leading roles variously connected to GE's work in lighting, energy, and also healthcare. And his career with GE has seen him working in the US, Europe, and Asia. Ronaldo is particularly interested in the issues around urban sustainability. Our next panelist started out as an astronomer, worked at NASA looking at climate change, and has also recently stood for political office. Ashwin Mahesh is based in Bangalore, where he's deeply involved with that city's transition. Today, he works on urban administration and policy issues, as an applied researcher. Ashwin is a founder of the social technology firm MapUnity, which built India's first city transport information system for Bangalore. He's also a member of various city, state, and national committees for urban development issues. He's also an editor of India's largest public affairs magazine, 
India together. Most of you probably already know the final person on our panel. Saskia Sassen is an academic whose writings have challenged the received wisdom about how cities, globalization, and migration work. She's the author of numerous papers and books, including The Global City. Saskia is certainly the product of a globalized world. She was born in Buenos Aires, spent her youth in Italy, studied in France and the US, and today lives between London and New York. Saskia is the Robert Eslin Professor of Sociology at Columbia University. Now, to begin our conversation this morning, we're going to have introductory remarks from all of the panel, and we're going to start with Saskia. Should I just speak from here? You're welcome. To, if just you're cosy sitting down, in, I'll stay seated. In if the you name prefer of the efficiency of time? I think in the efficiency Very of time, good. maybe to keep your seat. Yeah, right. Because just walking is a minute, and I've just wasted half a minute. So my starting point with cities, and I think cities are a window onto more complex realities. They are a challenge onto themselves. Think of a city, all the different parts in it. Uh, I find that I cannot just say simply the city is the city. I need something that is the non-city to explain what am I looking at, what is the DNA of this animal, and so I think of the city as a complex system, but incomplete. And in that mix of complexity and incompleteness lies the capacity of cities to keep reinventing themselves, to remake themselves. And I'm sure that our colleagues who talk about technology and other such issues, they can bring in a whole uh, range of versions of this kind of uh, reinventing of urban space. It also means that density is not enough to have a city. We can have endless rows of high-rise, very high-rise housing or office buildings, like as in office park. That is not city. There is an enormous amount, in my view, of built-up terrain today that is not city. It is built-up terrain. To get at cityness, you actually need much more than density, this notion that, ah, if it's this much density, we have a city, no. And so I think that one of the key challenges for cities are forces that are de-urbanizing cities. And they come in many different shapes. I don't really want to focus on that. But coming back to this hardcore notion of city as something that is complex but incomplete, and thinking about, if you want, the, the project that, the, that this conference aims at with its term, the human city, which I assume also is a bit of the humane city, a different word. <laughs> but uh, so I think of, um, of, of cities as, as being at the intersection of a whole number of forces. And this gives them a certain type of capacity to act on major historical processes. So um, one of these, has to do with the fact that more and more non-urban economic sectors actually have increasingly an urban moment. It comes in the form of a need. If you are a mining operation, if you are a plantation growing palm, you need cities. You need cities for a very practical reason, which is they you need insurance services, you need legal, you need accounting, etc. So when I look at cityness today, I see a lot of the non-urban also embedded in cities. Secondly, I think that there is an emerging urban geopolitics. If you think about this very vague term, globalization, what are we really talking about? Well, we're talking about financial markets, we're talking about you know, NGOs that go global, but we're also talking about a proliferation and a rapid growth of place-to-place -place transactions, necessities, the making of global spaces that are transversal, horizontal, multi-sited. A lot of what we call globalization happens at that level. And that has cities as key spaces in that kind of situation. I think when you look at geopolitics today, what you see is that sometimes it's not country to country. 
it's city to city. And I want to wind up, uh, because we are under very strict orders for being brief, I want to wind up with one both example of this city to city as an increasing presence and component of what we call geopolitics, interstate relations, if you want. And I want to also then illustrate this as a capability. One way of looking at cities is to detect that they actually contain and they make urban capabilities. So the example of this city to city is, of course, Rio 20. I'm sorry, we're in Sao Paulo, but this meeting happened in Rio plus 20, where the mayors from many very different parts of the world, many different types of the cities, actually talked with each other in a practical way that advanced the environmental agenda in a way that when the national leadership came, they sort of fell back onto the right to carbon trading, right? The right to have more, et cetera, of those uh, options. And that does not advance the environmental. Now the urban capability that one can detect in this. I have been doing research on what biologists who are interested in the environmental question are discovering. And when you look at some of these discoveries, I'll mention a couple very quickly. What you begin to see is that this complex space, this built up dense, enormously varied space that we call a city, actually can be a key anchor with all its defects and all its capacities to destroy the environment, can be a key resource for also addressing in a foundational way, a way that goes beyond policy and some sort of ameliorative uh, uh, policies. Two examples. One is the discovery uh, that a certain bacterium, when put in brown water, in other words, what we organic brown water is what we produce in vast quantities in kitchens, bathrooms, restaurants, etc. That bacterium produces a molecule of a kind of plastic, a biodegradable plastic. Now, when you think of cities and the challenge that it is to dispose of brown waters, the mistaken ways in which that is often done, and then you realize that what is now a negative, a burden, and something that often adds to environmental destruction, that that could actually be a new type of industry, where cities could actually be exporting a plastic, a biodegradable plastic. When you think that we need plastic in just about everything, and it's one of the great sources of environmental destruction, because it is not degradable, it's synthetic. So this is one such example, which is like a 180 degree transformation. And then you have a complex space such as the city continuously producing this. It could be an export industry, frankly. A new type of plastic exported from cities. The second one is a bacterium that if, that if you put it on concrete, I don't know, it has to be concrete, not just anything, not marble, not cement. It actually, as it lives its little life in that concrete, deposits a kind of calcium. That calcium seals off the building. It can be a sidewalk, etc., And it actually, eventually, there is a kind of temporality involved, produces an active purifying of the air around it. Again, Think of the city, this complex set of buildings and structures, as being a source of actual, with a bit of time, huh? actual purifying of air. From a global map, the city appears as a set of sites that are actually, yes, still also destroying, because we humans destroy from point A, from the moment we're here. But at the same time, these complex spaces that are cities, as something that is also purifying air and producing a biodegradable plastic. And I just want to leave you with those two, to me, beautiful examples. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. Some, <laughs> some very interesting points there about the, the, the ability of uh, cities to almost be self-healing, in a sense, having their own inbuilt sustainability. Um, I'm going to turn to you now, Vim. I know that you've got some real concerns that you've uh, shared over time, and even in the last day or so as we've met up about the fact there are so many things that we could be doing 
and we're a little bit slow at seizing the opportunities. Could you give us a little bit of your view about the, the situation you see and the human city that you imagine? Um, I will do that, Andrew. I will stand up, walk, and talk to gain yes. time. <laughs> um, I have a couple of slides um, to show you, uh, because we are very visual as human beings, I think. Um, so first, the human city. I think we all agree nowadays that um, cities make us more human. And if you look at the statistics around the world, and that countries that have an urbanization higher than 50% um, have better numbers, mortality rates, have better diversity. And we embrace the concept that urbanization is going to be with us, and this is going to be the century of urbanization. Whether we like it or not, we better move with it. The point, and, and John already alluded to that, is that 180,000 people a day are urbanizing. So do we have the time to absorb that? Um, and we are building a San Francisco worldwide every two months. How are we going to do that? And, and, and cities last for centuries. And cities are never complete, and we can always upgrade them. And but we are missing a component, and that component is speed, action, actionability, and make cities human. So this is the way I look at cities. I have to go one slide back. And it's, I look at cities um, as ecosystems, as spaces, and, and we have so much knowledge in this room from people who can design cities, uh, architects, uh, city planners. What we still often overlook is how to embed technology. At the last decade, we have seen a revolution. You know, I represent technology, and I'm walking here with papers. Did you see the mayor? He was working from his iPad. Um, if you think about my kids, and you know, I have two benchmarks. I have my kids, and I have my mother-in-law. My kids are 13 and 16 years old, and they have two statuses in life. They either sleep, or they are online. But, you know, that's the reality, and I hate it. You know, I want to read them books, and then they are sitting there with their thing. And then my son of 30 says, I'm reading a book, Dad. Because, you know, I get my iPad from school. It's a reality. Don't deny it. My mother-in-law is using Skype. She lives in the Netherlands. It's the first time in life that she understands a little bit what I'm doing. And she loves it. Uh, if we talk about that new car that Google is designing, and uh, which is driverless, and that we say, do we need this gadget? My father-in-law is 80. My mother-in-law, by the way, is handicapped. If he is losing his driving license, he's losing his independence. Then he has to go to assisted living. A driverless car will make him mobile in a city. It will give him his freedom at an aging, in an aging population. So at the concept, this is citizens' will. This is where citizens will rule. At George Orwell, 1984, Big Brother is watching you. No, citizens will watch Big Brother. And that is the power that we're going to unleash. That is the power how we have to rethink the digital towns, town square, how we are going to digitize it, and how we are going to reinvent government. And because the potential, the opportunities are fantastic. And, and we will have very important breakouts and best practices. and. Embrace the concept, learn, absorb it, and see how we can make it actionable. Benefits are so obvious. And, you know, I had a good conversation last night with uh, Mark Rawlings, the, the mayor of Dallas, and I asked him, what is your first priority? And he said, Wim, my first priority is always jobs. And if you are in a city, and it, the, the future of competition is going to be between cities. It's not going to be between nations. It's even in Brazil, it's Sao Paulo via Rio. It's going to be London versus Mumbai. But it's also competition for young people. In Australia already, between Brisbane, Melbourne, and Sydney, who can attract young people and talent? Jobs, however, is the number one concern of young people. And then next to that, if we redesign cities, if we revitalize cities, and we use technology smart, it's not about the technology, it's about what the technology can enable. And the citizen services, and the awareness, energy savings of 30% are relatively easy. Uh, lead certification, water consumption down by 50%. Uh, 
It's a relatively easy crime race. If people are more happy, crimes go down. And last but not least, traffic. And that's, um, I'm from Rotterdam, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. You know, these cities were not designed for cars. In the past, people went to a city to work. Nowadays, you go to a city to recreate. Amsterdam has its museums, and, and if you want to work, you can work everywhere. And I always say, don't commute to compute. I can work everywhere. I go to my work to meet people, to meet customers, and because the social aspect, we, we're social beings. And then education and healthcare in a virtual way, and it's second best, I know that, uh, but you can meet price points that give access to two billion people in the world who still don't have access to education or healthcare. In cities also, access is going to be important. So competition between cities are around three things. Economically, attracting jobs. It's about social aspects. If you want to attract young people, do you live? Can you attract them? And then environmental. Uh, if it's a mess, people don't want to live there. So if you look at five cities here, and, that's, and I combined Saulo, Paulo and Rio, and I apologize for that, uh, but uh, that's, look at Mumbai in India, look at New York, look at Shanghai, what all these cities have in common, uh, that Saskia talked about density, uh, it's density in the old way, we have slums. Um, I know that we have Corey Lowers here, she's the vice mayor of uh, Rotterdam, and she can keep me honest. Uh, I'm from Rotterdam. I'm chief globalization officer, but every four years I'm very, you know, Dutch, soccer, Olympic Games. Uh, pe people are tribal, so and my tribalism, my roots are in Rotterdam, and we have, uh, I'm from Shiloh's, and, you know, it's almost a slump. And the unemployment is high, every city has this issue. And it's so density, high rise, density, low rise. So my call for action in all these workshops is, you know, how can we come up with some templates? Perhaps we can come up with some models. Yeah, because human city, the theme in a slump, is something else than a human city in a high rise modern type of skyscraper. Yeah, but both have a value system and have a culture that we have to adapt and that we have to transform, we're running out of time, like I said. And that we have to accept that wave of urbanization. But we also are running out of time to adapt to technology. The tsunami is coming, the tsunami of opportunities. And that open data, more and more governments are opening their data and people can make applications. And we publish on a weekly basis 150 movies, 300 books, and 15,000 apps. There will be an app for everything. So that that whole speed and access and new opportunities is coming to us. And what it will take are five things. It will take thought leadership, uh, to, to have a plan that you can action, and that that's what we expect from, from our leaders. It, it will need global open standards to scale. And we have the beautiful project, GE, backpacks in Rio de Janeiro, but how can we scale it? How can we make it with global standards and get it quickly around? We get stuck in proof of concepts. We need smart regulation. My example is always when I went back to the US, my kids, 13 and 16 years old, never switch off the lights. We all know that. And so I gave them a dashboard and said, do you know what you waste every day? Now I give them 50% of the reductions and they switch off the light. You know, government by smart policies can do a lot. Public-private partnerships, we have, there is money enough. How do we make money at work? And we have to create ecosystems. We have to work together, and we have to collaborate for common goals. My call to action for the next two days, and I'm going to be here, I'm, I'm, I'm technology, but I also believe in building relationships. Let's have food together, let's think, the action is acceleration. We deserve acceleration of new processes. 180,000 people a day. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Fim, very much indeed. Uh, amazing here. The, the question there around the generational issue is, is it something we'll pick up later, whether there's going to be a revolution that happens in 10 years' time when the people who are in their 20s and 30s have taken all the jobs of the people in this building. And then we'll see what change really looks like, I think. But also just looking at that idea of you know, why we're not very good at kind of taking on the idea of infrastructure being put in for, for technology in the same way as we when we think we need a new water supply system, of course, we go to the city council, we expect it to be built, we demand it. Why is it it doesn't quite happen when you've come to technology in many of our cities? I'm going to turn to Ronaldo now. And uh, Ronaldo, we're here in Latin America, sitting in Sao Paulo. And I wonder if you could give us your perspective, how you see the world and the human city from here. No, I, I think uh, you know, the, the numbers are staggering. You know, 50% in living in the city in this country, 85% and it feels that way. You know, coming here from my home, I'm the local, right? I think I count on about 50 towers being built. So it's really, it's an amazing dynamic that happens here. And I've lived in many cities around the world and they all share the challenges. And people are attracted to the cities because of the jobs, because it's really a way to realize a lot of the, 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 the potential of the individuals. But as cities grow, grow, so grow the challenges, right? And we see them in, in, every, in every city, in some more than others. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the, the real challenge is, you know, is how to allow for the individuals to be able to explore their potential and at the same side, the same time, the city being able to deal with the needs of the population in terms of uh, uh, you know, the spatial challenges, social challenges, environmental challenges, right? So I, I think it's, uh, this begs two questions. One is how to shape the cities that allows for the ability of the individuals to grow and the cities to be able to take care of the needs in terms of power generation, in distribution of power, uh, electricity, the uh, water, cl the cleaning of the water, the, 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 the aspect of mobility that the mayor talked about, the aspect of uh, public health, big challenges, but also uh, you know, doing so in a way that is environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive, right? Uh, the panelists have already alluded to this, technology is an essential part for this. You know, if you're thinking about uh, some of the basic needs of a city, you know, the, the power generation, and you alluded to the fact of turning a problem into an opportunity, right? A landfills filled with trash, with garbage, generates biogas. You can burn that in gas engines. That is being done in Salvador, in, in Belo Horizonte, in Mexico City, the largest landfill in the world in the, in the city of Mexico. In, the, in my hometown, Ribeirão Preto, there's a project going on like that. In many cities around the world, turning a liability into a very important asset. The, the water treatment. Uh, a lot of the water in this country, this country is blessed with water, being an enormous amount of water. But in 30 years, the world is going to go from a surplus of water into a deficit of water. So, very important resource, probably going to be more important than, than oil. You know, treatment of water, the city of Campinas using immersed uh, membrane, membrane bioreactor technology, converting uh, sewer water into clean water. You can even go as far as making pure water, so pure that it does damage to the body because it takes the salt as you, as you drink it. So it, it all te all these technologies are available. And I'm not talking about the Jetson family type technology. We're talking about technologies of today. In, in terms of mobility, the ability to move more people in the same amount of time or with less amount of energy through smart signaling. Uh, or in the healthcare, as the, as the mayor pointed out, the importance of uh, public health in having a good primary care system, but a diag uh, early diagnostics, good treatment. And uh, an example that was alluded here, you know, in terms of how you actually provide inclusiveness inclusion in that aspect. In, in Rio, there's a very interesting project, which I was personally skeptical at first, but now I am a, a converted believer in, in, uh, with a very, in a very simple way, you know, bringing a, in a backpack a number of technologies that can be used for initial assessment and diagnosis. Uh, and uh, in the hands of 11 health professionals in one of the communities, a slum in, uh, in Rio, Santa Marta, they, in, in a period of 30 weeks, you know, they visited 200, uh, made 200 visits, covered a very large number of the population, and was able to take health 
to the people in the slums, particularly the old that had difficulties going down the hill because Rio is like this, right, full of hills, going down the hills and up the hill. So old people did not have to go to the clinics. The health came to them. And what is very interesting is that that approach, which was able to identify the disease before it became even more problematic, uh, and also avoiding some of the hospital hospitalization that normally would take place, this, uh, they, they studied, they, the, University of, uh, the State of University of Rio has been able to quantify that for every 100 patients, there's $200,000 savings. So this is very important. So it's a very simple, very simple solution on the health side. So technology in all of these sectors and many more can be an answer. It's an essential part of the solution, but it's not sufficient. A important aspect of it is how to use the technology. And I would say in many of the cities, particularly in the emerging world, that is really the bottleneck. It's the project development, it's the project management, it's the financing, it's the completion of this over a long period of time. In, in most of the countries in the world, you got elected officials that have a, a, a tenure. Many of these projects have a, uh, the life cycle cost of this or the payback is over a period of time which may be beyond that period of, of, the, of the tenure of the elected official, right? So the metrics have to be somewhat adjusted, but the, the solutions also exist in that. Uh, the BPP, which you alluded, is one very, is very practical way to deal with this, where you turn a very large capex that in many cases the public sector will not be able to absorb, particularly in a four-year period, and you let the private sector come in with the right solution, with the right technology, the project development people, with the project management and the financing and be able to resolve this. A lot of what we're talking about has to do with public services, public, uh, the, the public sector, and that is traditionally the model that is, being, that is used, right? But how many projects can a public sector carry on at the same time? It's really a lot, a lot that has to be done. So in terms of having the bandwidth to be able to deal with this, I think the, the combination of the public sector with the private sector to really bring in that expertise in terms of project development, project management, and financing, and the public sector particularly establishing the outcomes, specking the outcomes as the representative of the population. It's very normal that the public sector says, hey, this is what I need. And the private sector then being able to deliver according to the approaches and technology and processes that each one of these have. So I think uh, technology is essential, but it's largely a, an issue of a project management in terms of being able to address a lot of the needs that exist today. Thank you very much, Ronaldo. Thank you. So it was, it was really fascinating to hear there, you know, that the technology is great, but you do need the partnerships that wrap around it, whether that's you know, the public or the uh, state bodies or other private companies, they need to come in alliance with you. And it's also really interesting to see how a company like GE is actually thinking about social inclusion with the products it, it sends out there into market. Uh, Ashwin, I know that you're involved in, on a kind of a day-to-day -day basis with trying to make a city better in, a, in Bangalore. Could you tell us a little bit about your projects? Um, yeah. I, I'd like to make three points. One, um, Wim mentioned that 180,000 people are moving into cities on a daily basis. Half a percent of that moves into my city. <laughs> <laughs> 900 people a day move to Bangalore. And uh, you just can't imagine a number like that. You need to build a school every second day or every third day or something like that. You need to have a hospital come up every second week or third week, and this goes back to what Ronaldo said, there's only so little that the public sector can do to keep up with that level of demand. We've got a social problem. Urbanization is creating fundamentally a social challenge. Now, if you have a technology problem, well, you pull together a bunch of really com uh, competent and uh, innovative technologists, and you give them the problem and ask for a solution, and at some point they do come up with it. Uh, if you've got a managerial problem, you get a bunch of administrators to do this thing. But if you have a social problem, who should solve social problems? I mean, it's something for all of us to think about. Who should solve social problems? And I'm going to submit to you that all of us, every single person in society, should solve social problems. So this is the first point that I'd like to make. 
which is that in order to be able to meet the challenges of urbanization, it is not enough to scale the solutions. Instead, you have to scale the number of problem-solving people. And this is the first thing that is absolutely needed in every society. If you are going to have any chance at all of tackling this level of urbanization, you're going to have to vastly increase the number of people who are working on the problem. And where do you have this opportunity to, to scale the large number that is needed? My answer to that is that this has to be done in the universities and in the schools, primarily in the universities. There's something about life that when you come out of the university, you actually know fewer people. Um, but when you're in the university, you know a lot more people. And the opportunity for scaling this ecosystem that you refer to is actually much, much greater in the universities and in the colleges than anywhere else. But there's also a second reason why this has to be done in the university. If you want more people to be able to solve problems, they have to know how to solve problems too. And therefore, there's a learning component that is strongly attached to the ability to solve these problems. Somewhere along the line, enough of us have to know how to solve public problems. And the university is, in theory at least, an extraordinary place for learning things. In practice, it has become a fossil uh, around the world the overwhelming majority of universities can be safely shut down and nobody would notice. Um, <laughs> and there's a reason for that. The nature of uh, the complexity and the incompleteness that uh, Professor Sasson referred to in the urban challenges is impossible to solve by formal university instruction in any number of classes that you might take. Um, instead, what you need is a kind of immersion program that actually teaches you civics from civic practitioners, teaches you transportation from transportation management practitioners, and so on and so forth. We need to reimagine learning and we need to reimagine the university to be able to deliver this learning. It's absolutely essential. If you have to have any ch chance at all to be able to solve the challenges of urbanization and globalization in our respective geographies, we have to say, what do we need to do to the schools and the colleges in order to be able to create the vast numbers of people needed to manage this complexity, uh, which is simply not doable through formal systems of administration. So that's the second thing, the, uh, the, scaling, uh, the scaling of the numbers of problem-solving people and the reimagination of learning spaces as a necessary component of that response. The third thing has to do with government and companies that do businesses with the government. Government needs to reimagine itself too. Government needs to be much more open about data that it controls. There needs to be public information. There needs to be public input. There needs to be, as Mayor Haddad was saying earlier, a much more decentralization of money, decentralization of decision-making authorities, um, I, I, I'm not being particularly critical, but it's invariably true that state politicians often, and city politicians often talk to you about how the central federal government is overbearing and centralized, but in many neighborhoods in their own cities, they will tell you that the city government is highly centralized and federalized, and neighborhood level control of decision making is virtually not there. So you see the problem from where you are standing. At some level, therefore, you have to build the structure of government in a way that imagines that people have rights, people have access to money, access to resources to solve problems in their own neighborhoods. And that makes it easier even for city leaders and state leaders to make the case that national governments also have to be like this. Um, and companies too have an obligation here, we've talked about this before, that it would be extraordinarily useful to the urbanization challenge if companies position their products, their services to governments in a way that embraced the future. Not simply as a way of saying to governments, here's a technology platform that you can use to achieve a public sector outcome or a public service delivery that you're responsible for, but that we will actually prefer you to, to buy the product of the future rather than buy the product of the present. Too many, com too many governments around the world uh, certainly in developing countries, are buying the products of the past. They're not, not even buying the products of the present. They're buying the products of the past. We need to move to an environment in which companies, responsible companies, forward-thinking companies, are selling to governments the products of the future. And the product of the future is not something that is merely bought by the government. 
the product of the future is something that is also used by the government, maybe even paid for by the government. But it's fundamentally an open product that is available to the public as much to the government, available to researchers in, some, in terms of data as much as it is available to the government, uh, available to activists in terms of accountability measures as much as it is available to the government. So if companies begin to move to products that meet these diverse needs of complexity and incompleteness, you know, the challenges of complexity and incompleteness, you'll actually get outcomes. My experience in doing these things, I'm just gonna speak two words about this, Andrew, since you asked specifically. Some years ago, I built the Bangalore traffic information system. Nobody actually asked me to do it. It just seemed possible to do it, so I did it. Um, and then a couple of months ago, I built the Bangalore Heritage Information System, and now we're starting to build heritage information systems for every city in India. Um, fundamentally, there's a certain commonality of technologies in the urban space, spatial, MIS, there's a certain structure to the urban space which allows you to repeat public information systems and platforms for, uh, for urban problem solving. And my experience has been that if you build these platforms, and if you encourage these platforms to be built by the public themselves, actually even the public sector moves to working with you. After I built the traffic information system, the police commissioner came to me and said, what is this thing that you guys are building? How can we use it? After we started building a health informatics product, people from the health department come to me and say, well, how can we use this thing in our health delivery? So there's a certain capacity for imagining ourselves as members of an ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, your role play is not defined by the job that you have, it's not defined by who pays your salary. Your role play is defined by your capacity to complete the incompleteness of the urban challenge. To be able to say that you or I know how to create good media, how to create good technology platforms, how to create a piece of this ecosystem that you and I need to solve urban problems. And if we do this, we'll get something really great, what we call the holy grail of democracy. Speaking in a very rural area, Abraham Lincoln said 150 years ago that democracy is government of the people, for the people, and by the people. In a, in a very technological way, in a very technological way, in a very social way, we have to imagine and answer, ask and answer the question, what does by the people mean? And I submit that in the urban context, by the people means that people can themselves become managers of the city not users of services and products produced for them, but managers of the city, maintaining public infrastructure, maintaining public works, uh, documenting various things, alerting the public to things that need to happen. Many of the things that we've thought of as public sector functions are actually performable by the public themselves. And the more you bring the public themselves into becoming parts of what I would call this publicly managed city, rather than a managed for the public, managed by the public. That's when you'll see a real acceleration towards meeting some of the challenges that we see in the urban arena. Thank you very much. Well, that was interesting to hear from Ashwin about the, the potential to kind of rethink how we solve social problems and create a new generation of people who are able to do that. He also threw down some big challenges to the world of education and business, and he managed to do that while sitting amongst a professor and the head of GE, so well done there. Um, we're gonna take a few questions here between us, and then we'll quickly go to the floor in just, in just two minutes. So just a couple of quick questions, and I'll be coming straight down to the floor in a second. Can I just, Vim, come to you quickly? You, you, you're concerned about the speed at which we adopt these ideas, and you do hint it's a generational thing. Do you think that we're at the point of you know, a cusp of change that we will see rapid change because actually many of these people who are in their 20s and 30s are now making it into power? Or do you think we still have a kind of a time lapse to wait? You know, uh, in 30 seconds, I think we have to invite more young people in our meetings. Uh, they think different, they have a different perspective. And that if you talk about regulation, things like privacy and security mean something entirely different. Uh, they grow up by sharing. And as we, we talk about uh, basically the digital uh, natives and the digital immigrants. And that some people already say everybody above 40 uh, is, is, is too old for that. And if I look around, of course, we're all exceptions here. Uh, but inclusiveness of young people in problem solving, uh, because they live different, they work different, they play different, they absorb it, they don't question it. 
Ronaldo, who do you think uh, to blame for the failure to adopt ideas quickly? Is it a failure of civic government? Is it a failure of a lack of money, a failure of ambition? Why do you think that often when you do have good solutions available, that city governments will then choose something that's maybe the cheapest, not the best, or that they will go down ch uh, choice lines which seem not to be sustainable in the longer term? Who, who's to blame? Well, I think it's a, uh, it's a complex uh, question. I, mean, I, I would say that uh, a lot of these, the, the solutions that are necessary for these complicated problems in the cities, the, the life of the, these projects, they are long, you know, they may be 20 years, 30 years, requires enormous amount of money, okay? So when you start it, uh, imagining the solution, it can be very attractive. When you get into the details, they can be extremely expensive up front. So the, the, the mentality of a, I as the city must do this and I have to pay for it and absorb it, it may be very difficult financially to deal with this, okay? So that's why I go back to the point that I made earlier that I think uh, bringing the private sector that has, can have a longer term perspective from an investment standpoint and deal more, better with a 20, 30 year type of investment and be able to amortize that is that tends to be a, a better solution, okay? So I would say it's the approach that, uh, that can be, let's say, to blame. Now, we only have 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that I open this uh, to the audience as well before we finish. And uh, there's a microphone going around, I believe. And if there's a, a lady here in the front row, if we could ask the, the first question here, please. Could, you, uh, could everybody who asked a question, if they could kindly say their name? And that would be great for us. Thank you. My name is Barbara Judge, and I'm chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund. So my question to the panel is, what about the role of leadership? We really haven't talked about the leadership of a city. What about the role of the rule of law, about the corruption index, about how do we encourage investment in infrastructure? What about reforming the planning processes? All of the things that we've talked about today are very important, but structure, bringing investment into the city in a way that makes people feel secure that their investments will go farther. Can we just talk a little bit about those subjects? Manesh, Ashwin, rather, perhaps we could start with you here, because I know that you've, you've been involved with corruption issues in Bangalore, and it's a, a city that's growing at an amazing pace, and it throws up all the challenges of corruption that come with that, of, you know, of building, of, of, of licenses for building. What kind of issues do you see around leadership? Well, the, the, it's, it's funny that the sort of the, the conversation about leadership is positioned in, in a way that almost pre-imagines who the leader should be, and that fundamentally defeats leadership. The, if you're going to say that we need mayors who do this, we need city governments whose contracts are honored well, uh, if we need decisions that uh, reflect solutions to 20-year problems and 15-year problems, and of course you need all of that. But my submission is that a good ecosystem for problem solving actually is more capable of producing that kind of leadership than merely to go to the existing leadership and say, well, we want all these things from you. It's simply not gonna happen. In many cities around the world, the problem today is that the legitimacy of certain role players for solving complex problems is, suffi is not sufficiently wide enough. So it doesn't really matter what the mayor has committed to. It doesn't really matter what the minister for urbanization has committed to. He doesn't command sufficient respect in an ecosystem of problem solving. He doesn't command enough authority in each of the nest com incomplete spaces to be able to go and produce this outcome. He can't produce the learning environment in which there are enough problem solvers because he's not also the education minister. He can't produce the planning environment because planning is multi-hierarchical in government and multidisciplinary. So my submission to you is that we've got to reimagine leadership. We've got to say that we don't really want leadership for the city alone. We want leadership for problem solving. That if you had leadership for problem solving, the leadership of the city, whoever it is, would be reasonably well aligned to the leadership for problem solving and also reasonably well connected to that ecosystem of problem solving, which they know they cannot deliver on their own. So fundamentally, what I would request is that enough of us Imagine that when we expect cities to behave in a particular way, that behavior is often the result of how that society is structured. To expect a certain kind of accountable behavior 
out of in a, a structure of society which is itself not powerful in many nodes is simply not going to happen. So we've got to reimagine the city as a place with multiple centers of power, with multiple capacities for problem solving and multiple capacities for power. And we have to get comfortable with that. The idea that strong leadership in one direction is going to produce the outcomes that we want is sort of nice. It maybe even helps make money in the short term, but I don't think it's sustainable. Saskia, I think you wanted to jump in. Well, I think that, that yeah, that I think there are, I, I totally agree with what you said, but I would add a couple of other things. <clears throat> One is that we, the citizens, we, the residents of the city, have basically become consumers rather than makers. And this then brings up a second question, which connects also to what Will was saying. We need, to, we, we need to use these technologies also to connect and to be able to take out the knowledge of neighborhoods, of particular areas of expertise. Distributed knowledge is one of the features of a city. And I agree with that. Some universities could be closed and nobody would notice, really. <laughs> And the United States has about 3,500 universities, and probably many of them, we could go that way. Uh, so, but there is enormous knowledge in neighborhoods. When immigrants come to a neighborhood, they, they bring knowledges with them that maybe your typical middle class person doesn't have. And here, third point, a kind of open source urbanism. I do think that one of the problems, and uh, you have heard me say this, uh, Will, is, is that a lot of the technology that is getting deployed is complex, but closed. And what is uh, supposedly interactive, actually, is you have five choices. That's not interactive. So how is there a feedback loop that if the locals know something, or whatever, the experts on Wall Street, whatever it might be, know something, how can that feed back? And I also agree completely that it, just the government, in a narrow sense, is not enough. We need distributed sources of recognized knowledge, expertise, and, and sort of that they are ready to move. And I think the human city, the humane city, I keep thinking about that distinction. <laughs> but uh, somebody will explain to me, uh, John, you will explain, why human rather than humane city? Huh? Um, uh, that's just a little provocation. But um, so, so I really think that, that the, the cities are an ecology. There is a kind of distributed format that is at the heart of a city. Many of our cities, are no longer cities because it is not that distributed format with all these differences. So yeah, there is a lot of work to be done, but I do think that a working city of the future would have those kinds of features. Now, I think it's time to take one very quick question and probably the, the panelists are gonna have to give very high speed answers. Is there anybody else here who has a question? There's a lady here at the back. My name, uh, good morning. My name is Laura Valente de Macedo. I am a, cons I am a consultant in urban sustainability with WRI in Brazil, the World Resources Institute. And I would like to ask you, uh, in a globalized world, considering that we have a panel with uh, different stakeholders, how, would, uh, how could governments and businesses and academia and the other stakeholders uh, collaborate so that companies would have the same performance and the same uh, principles and criteria uh, in, in their developing country branches as they have in, in their original countries so that we could guarantee sustainability in a more humane city. I totally agree with Dr. Uh, Sassen. Thank you. R Ronaldo, what would be your view of that in 30 seconds? No, I think uh, the, uh, the, this, is, this is happening. Uh, I would say, in fact, the concept of uh, reverse innovation where technologies that used to be developed in in the United States or Europe or Japan that now are being developed in India, in Brazil, in China, and going back into Europe, okay? Because I think the needs of a lot of these emerging markets are coming at a very fast speed and abruptly. So I think there's a big advantage for in setting up innovation capabilities, research centers in a lot of these markets. And it's happening, it's happening in Brazil. And Vim? Um, I think uh, openness, collaboration, um, and that's, we have sessions here going on. Uh, look at best practices, learn, uh, be open, see what you can use. How can we spread best practices? Well, I'm afraid that's all there's time for. Uh, I want to thank all of the people on the panel, to Saskia, to Ashwin, to Ronaldo, and to Vim. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you. We're going to let uh, Ronaldo uh, just 
dash off, I believe, because he has a plane literally, I think, around the corner, I'm almost waiting for him. But if everyone could just wait one second, I just wanted to conclude just a f with a couple of comments, actually. If, you, oh, if you've got a second, okay. <laughs> I just know that you have your, your plane and, and an assistant waiting to grab you in like what, three seconds' time. Um, it was amazing to hear uh, all the comments from the people on the panel. It was, it was fascinating to hear about the idea of a new class of people running cities in Bangalore and coping with a city that's growing at 900 people a day. is an unimaginable figure for us sitting here, but really incredible. And it's interesting to hear from Saskia about the idea of the city as being self-sustaining, what it's got built into it already to protect itself and grow. And fascinating to hear from Ronaldo and GE about the work that they're doing. You know, that So often we think about big technology companies, we forget what happens as it trickles down. And it was amazing to hear how in Latin America, and Brazil especially, there are so many projects going on that are really changing the way we de deliver healthcare, the way that we clean water, the way that we you know, help people move around their cities. And also brilliant to hear from Vim, a call to action that you know, we need speed, we need progress, we can't just wait around. There's a lot of talking that goes on, especially <laughs> events like this probably, but we need to get out of here afterwards and start doing a few things. I just want to conclude also by saying that, um, as people probably know from Monocle magazine, we're doing two live radio shows from here today and tomorrow. We're also making a film about this event, so hopefully we'll be able to meet many of you more over the next couple of days. But I just wanted to say thank you very much, and I know that everybody now needs to make their way over to the Ocker building, where there's going to be coffee, and there's going to be a chance to meet other people and go to the breakout sessions. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Andrew, as you're making your way out, I just want to remind you that now we have the coffee break in the other building in Oka, so you cross a little bit of this beautiful park. And then we have three fantastic breakout sessions starting at noon on Sao Paulo, on the topic of mobility, and on the topic of urban data. Then we have lunch, and I would ask that you, are, you come back here at 2.25, 2.25 sharp, for the uh, keynote address by the great architect and our great friend, Daniel Liebeskin. Thank you very much. <laughs>